And Democratic candidate for Congress right here in California, a man named Andy Caffrey, says if he wins, uh, he will smoke a joint right on the steps of Capitol Hill. And adding that, if he has to, he will even get arrested. So in other words, if he's elected, he'll take taxpayer money, get high, and not get anything done. Hey, welcome to Congress. He should fit in just fine. I think he'll fit in just fine. Oh. The Republicans are destroying our democracy. They're literally dismantling it. I've seen Charles Hurwitz come in and take over the Pacific Lumber Company, a 100-year-old sustainable family company, and destroy the old growth forest ecosystem. They've shut down the mills. There is no Pacific Lumber Company. There's no old growth mills anymore because there's no more product. I'm here to fight for you and especially for your children. Hi, I'm Andy Caffrey and I approve this message. Okay. Hey, welcome to Edge of the Herd. This is your host, Bud Rogers, and um, the introduction was for uh, some of uh, Andy Caffrey's um, noted words. Um, I'd just like to say a little bit about the, the, um, the uh, show that was just on, talking about the Cop Mountain. Um, this is totally related to the Israeli military coming over here and training our police in how to deal with domestic violence. So that's why the violence is going up. That is why, as far as I know. So anyway, um, one day while gazing out my window at the beautiful landscape, a possible topic for this show suddenly occurred to me. Basically, being as we are constantly entering to another election cycle, uh, which causes global warming, by the way, the hot, hot air, <laughs> what should we use as a litmus test for candidates that, for office? In chemistry, a slip of litmus cardstock, when determining if a given solution is an acid or a base, the, the, it will turn red if it's an acid and blue if it's basic. Instead of litmus paper, we can use questions to determine how the candidate stands in relation to the needs of our people and the dire situation we all face, because we're all in this together. <laughs> and so what would these questions be? And while we're thinking about that, I want to introduce our honor view guest, Andy, Andy Caffrey. Hi, Andy. Hey, bud. How's it going, buddy? Hey. Well, so far, um, pretty good. Uh, oh, and I want to say a little bit about the the block party yesterday. It was fantastic. Lots of fun. I'm a little tired, you know. <laughs> I got home, what, 1130 or something like that? <laughs> and I got there very early, you know, like nine. <laughs> so that was a long day. But we made it, and... Um, they're just outside collecting all the garbage and taking it to the, the dump and everything. So that's, and uh, so that's, the, you know. Anyway, how you doing? Uh, does does your last name Caffrey mean you don't drink coffee? Caffrey? Oh, caffeine free, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, oh. uh, it's my staple every morning. First okay. thing I do. <laughs> well, you're free. You're free to use caffeine. Yeah, <laughs> so far. People might remember you for your athletic politics, you know, running for office. Right, right. That's athletic yeah. politics. Yeah, better than jogging. But, but for those of you who don't know Andy, could you, Andy, tell us a little bit about your story, where you came from, where, why you came here, et cetera. Then we'll move right into those questions. Well... You have a lot to say, um, and so we can either – I can either ask you questions or you can just uh, go on with what you had planned, you know. Or we can do both. You can ask me some questions. Okay. we got, we got, what, 90 minutes now? And, and this is a call-in show too, right? So people later on will yes. be able to call in? Yes. We'll open the phone lines at some point. Um, so here's a – You want my background? Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I grew up in Los Angeles, um, 
in I was born in 1957, and uh, 1956 and 57 were the two smoggiest years in the history of Los Angeles. And I joked that when I was born, they didn't have to slap me to make sure I was breathing because I looked out the window and saw the smog and coughed. <laughs> uh, I, I was very sensitive, mm. not not biochemically, not my body, but emotionally to the fact that I felt I was being raised in a po poison gas war. And I learned very soon about the corruption of the automobile and gasoline companies and how they controlled the Los Angeles city and county governments and realized at a very young age that, age that um, things that we considered scientific, like poisons going into your body, were actually at heart political problems. And of course, you and I know that behind politics is economics. And so I never really had a, a free childhood. I just felt I needed, the first decision I made about what I would do as an adult was get the hell out of Los Angeles. <laughs> and that's what I did. And I, I got a nomination to the Naval Academy at Annapolis. So that's where I went for a little while. But um, they all knew that I went there to become a scientist. I wanted to become a new Jacques Cousteau. I wanted to study marine biology. But Congress that year outlawed the pre-med programs at Annapolis and the other service academies. So when I got there, since that was the only program that required biology, they shut down their whole biology department. So I would have had to have decided on a physics or chemistry major as a freshman, decided uh, since I'd never taken physics that there was no way I'd do that. And so I resigned, and I hadn't told UC San Diego I wasn't coming, so a month later I showed up at UC San Diego, where I worked with a lot of Scripps Institution of Oceanography scientists and worked on some projects there at Scripps and the very first lecture from my very first professor who was Roger Revelle and if you remember that name um, he also taught Al Gore. He taught both of us about a decade apart about what he had started calling the greenhouse effect in 1957 and so that's when I actually became a climate activist. And, um, 1957? 1957, well yeah when I was born no, no, 1957 is when he, as he, he had been a Harvard professor and um, he had been the director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, for about 15 years. And then he's the person who actually got UC San Diego started. So he was a pretty old guy teaching chemistry at UCSD uh, when I got there. And uh, he was talking about that. So he was talking to us about it in 1976. And I guess about 10 years earlier, he was talking about it to Al Gore because Roger had been talking about it since at least 1957. He also started a program which has became totally relevant to me in, in, in these times. He, he started International Geophysical Year, which was the world going down to Antarctica and starting for the first time to learn about the glaciers and, and the whole continent. Yeah, imagine a whole continent just being explored scientifically for the first time. So that's one of the problems we have today when we talk about ice sheet collapse is that We've only been really studying that stuff since um, since International Geophysical Year. So I uh, graduated, I didn't graduate from college. I became an activist, became a, a petitioner for the Bottle Bill and other campaigns, and got into Earth First in the 80s. And in Earth First, of course, we were talking about native forests, old growth forests, mycorrhizal fungi, all of the conservation biology stuff that, that I had been taught by. Um, uh, Michael Soule, the founder of the Society for Conservation Biology. And so um, basically I've been doing activism that I think will have the greatest likelihood of success. And then in uh, 2006, remember that's when these bloggers came on the scene, and the bloggers um, won the House of Representatives for the Democrats, and Nancy Pelosi became speaker for the first time. Because there were about 15, 15 or 17, I still haven't checked on what it is, but 15 or 17 states that the Democrats won by 5,000 votes or less. And I give the bloggers credit for getting them over the plate on those things. So I came up with this idea that if we focused on the districts where we lost by 5,000 votes or less and, and didn't think of elections as something to come up every few years but just started working on it nonstop, that we could start to win the elections that we lost, we meaning the Democrats, 
um, that uh, we lost by 5,000 votes, and then expand to the ones we lost by 10,000 votes. And then do the same thing in the primaries, which is even more important, is the progressives and the Greens could start to defeat the corporatist Democrats. So I came up with this concept of an electoral revolution, and I learned that in our district, which was California's first district at the time, because three out of four voters who are registered to a party are registered as Democrats, whoever wins the Democratic Party um, um, nomination will win the seat. And because nobody had run against Mike Thompson, Mike Thompson was only getting about 70,000 votes, which meant that if you got half of those votes, you could literally win the election and become a member of Congress. All you had to do is organize to get 35,000 votes in a district of 700,000 people. And so I ran for Congress three times, <clears throat> um, mainly around what's happening with Antarctica. And uh, I'll tell you about that when we get into that in a little bit. But uh, basically, our ice sheets are collapsing. And 154 nations have ocean coastlines. And the West Antarctic Ice Sheet has enough ice to raise sea levels 20 feet. And uh, two years after I ran for Congress for the first time, NASA announced that the collapse of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet is now unstoppable. So that means that 20 feet of sea level rise, whenever that comes, is certain. There is no ambiguity on it. It's only been, been proved to be worse and worse as the years have gone by. And so I thought that... The only place to really get attention to something like this that was so outside of the box that people, nobody was talking about it was to become a member of Congress, and from that position, I'd be able to talk about that. So uh, I haven't run for office since 2018, um, and I'm still working, though, on this issue. I've made a, made a video for COP27, um, which I invite you to check out at my YouTube channel. Just look for the one that says COP27 planetary game change, and, uh, and as we'll get into it, I think people need to start talking about um, not just the climate crisis, but the polar ice sheet collapse crisis when they talk to their politicians. Yeah, and single-payer health care <laughs> as well, <laughs> you know. Well, we can get into that too. <laughs> um, I mean, now, one, the, the, the things, okay, so we still, we have this I mean, at least if they're going to poison us, that they'd pay for our medical care. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Who is it? I was just hearing the other day was saying someone called into Tom Hartman's show and said that um, if they're going to push Social Security's um, the re you know, retirement age up, they have to recognize that there aren't jobs for seniors. So they've got to do a lot of support to get seniors jobs. What would we do? <laughs> I don't know. I should get paid for what I do. Build a decentralized, bioregionally centric uh, global economy. We'll say that again. We have to. Okay, if you want to look at sustainability. Now, what's yeah, that term? What's that sustainability term? meaning <laughs> that we don't tax the biosphere and the individual ecosystems within the biosphere beyond their limits. For example, when I came up here in 88, 98% of the native redwood forest was gone. It had been mined. You know, we, we talk about Richardson Grove and these places, but they're just these remote little islands. Whenever I go down there, you know, I love the place, but I see everything around it. You know, I see the, you know, looming new Sahara Desert coming up around it. And, and so, um, you know, we, we, our politicians talk about dollars and acres. They don't talk about the biosphere. They don't talk about ecosystems. They don't talk about ecological tolerances. And that's a big problem. That's something that's got to change. Well, they, they're beholding to their funders, you know. Got to give them a break. The poor, you know, politicians are up in their um, suites uh, at night, you know, walking the floor, wringing their hands. Oh, where am I going to get another million dollar for my campaign and, you know, and by the time they get the money, they're just going to do whatever uh, is told to them by the ones that funded their political campaign. And yeah. that, it's why they should just take money out of politics. Let Absolutely. The, let, yeah, let the American 
public pay for the time on, you know, the television or whatever, so they, you know, can have debates and real debates and, uh, you know, um, callers can call in questions, <laughs> you know, because the question, when they do have a debate, the questions are, you know, don't go anywhere, you know. They don't go where we need to question, you know what I mean? Well, it, our, our politics is so screwed up. I, I recently saw our congressman and, and the guy I ran against all three times, Jared Huffman, uh, do a little very short meeting at the Healy Center here about a month and a half ago. And I felt so uncomfortable because after about 15 minutes of just praising Jared Huffman before he was, you know, before he started talking, a kind of vibe was set up like, like we were in church. <laughs> and, and you're never rude or, or speak out against the flow when you're in a church. And uh, oh, well, Michael, that, Ma but, <laughs> Michael McCaskill and I were, you know, we're pretty independent people and, and we had things on our minds. And, and we, when we said these very reasonable things, very important things, there were a few people who were like, oh, you know, don't be so harsh with Jared. So there's this whole cult dynamic that's, that's evolved, even among progressive Democrats. Because I think what's happened is, what I learned was that people think, I want to vote for someone who shares my views, um, who agrees with me on abortion rights, on the environment, on uh, support for our community hospitals, um, free public education through college, whatever it might be. And what they don't realize is it, it doesn't matter what people think about when they're in Congress. What matters is are they going to get any of it passed? Are they going to actually change anything? <laughs> and so you look at these guys, even Bernie Sanders, he, I mean, he's only had a, a couple of things in his whole career, bills, that passed. And Huffman, when he was running against me in 2012, he was bragging that as a, what was he, a state senator or assemblyman for about six years. He had, about 44, I think, was the number of bills he had written that were passed there. And he wow. made us think, oh, so I can get things done in Congress. And he's like, I only know of like one or two bills that he's gotten done in 10 years. And, and you know, it's things like getting us a nice little trail on the Mendocino Coast. And, and he's gotten some funding for various projects. And, and I know a lot of the conservation people here appreciate things that he's done for some of our forests. You know, so I'm not here to like diss all of that. But that stuff doesn't matter if you let the ice sheets collapse, if you don't oust the fascists, and you have Trump stack the Supreme Court, and then we'd lose choice for women. You know, <laughs> okay, so he got some funding for our hospitals and, and support for some, you know, groves around here or something. Okay, that's, that's wonderful, but, you know, everything else is going to hell. And so what's happened is a lot of people, a lot of progressive Democrats, didn't like that Michael and I were calling out our congressman who should know better because he's just, he's, he's just, I, it was so weird to see him 10 years later. You know, he and I like each other, actually. We've never had, you know, harsh words with each other until after this Healy thing when he wrote me this weird letter. Um, you know, I, I thought of him as being on our side, and, and he gave me his emails, personal email, about five or six years ago so I could send him this information we'll talk about regarding what's happening with the polar ice sheets. And then he wrote me back and he said, oh, I'm not going to watch your weird video and all this kind of stuff. And, <laughs> and it was like, wow, he just doesn't want to accept that um, the climate crisis isn't going to get better while the ice sheets are collapsing. I'm, I mean, think about it. 20 feet of sea level rise is going to hit the world in the next few decades. And nobody, nobody, except for me, really, is talking about that. And so I put together a video for COP27 where I pulled together the, the videos that the scientists who've been studying it made, the scientists who got me alarmed with their research, and he, without even watching it, calls it a weird video. You know, it's NASA and James Hansen, and there's a fantastic sea level expert at the University of Washington named Peter Ward. Um, and he doesn't want to talk about it. And I said, well, you know, when NASA announced that the collapse was unstoppable, this is what I talked to him about that he thought was so rude of me. I said, you should have had hearings to call out the politicians who swore an oath of office to defend our nation, who instead 
supported the fossil fuel interest to the point where we got so much CO2 up in the atmosphere that our ice sheets are collapsing. And, and here's another thing, like if, if uh, some of our petroleum is, um, uh, you know, um, in, in jeopardy or something, uh, we will send in the Marines, you know, literally, because that's who keeps their back. We don't fight wars because of freedom or liberty or any of that. We fight wars to be the one who claims the oil for ourselves. And so, like, they're so far away from what we should be doing. We should not burn any petroleum product. We should be using other means to have our cars zipping down the road. One thing I think, you know, and I've had this idea for a long time, we need we need mass transportation. And the Republicans always blocked it. And I've been in California for a long time, and they always block anything that has to do with saving gas money or anything. You know, just... Um, well... No progress. Exactly. And it's not just the Republicans. Um, let's look at Joe Manchin right now. Now, imagine this. If, if I had been elected to Congress in 2012, and then NASA made this announcement and presentation that our ice sheets were collapsing, I would have organized hearings to call out all of the members of Congress who had supported the fossil fuel industry, were still supporting things like fracking, um, and call them traitors. Because every square foot of America's coastlines is going to be under 20 feet of water. And I mean, let's, uh, let's, um, let me expand on that. So, I mean, four feet would be devastating. Well, okay, in, in the video that I prepared that Dar Jared doesn't want to watch, I grabbed something from a National Geographic special um, where this guy, Peter Ward from the University of Washington, was interviewing a scientist at, I think, UC Davis. And the scientist there was studying the Central Valley of California, and he said two feet of sea level rise will take out the water in the Central Valley and eliminate the water supply for 27 million Californians. Uh, so, so how did how does that happen now? Was two feet sea of sea level rise going through the Golden Gate and in, up through the Delta okay. will take out the, the water supply for 27 million Californians. That's two feet. Now, think about this. Well, well, let me give you the, the numbers, actually. So, so what happened was NASA in 2014, May 12, 2014, I'll never forget that day, they made this announcement that the collapse is unstoppable. 20 feet of sea level rise is unstoppable. But they did not indicate anything about what the time frame was. One scientist I saw said, oh, maybe 100 or 200 years. Then, in 2015, James Hansen's team came out with a report including these same NASA scientists that said, we're going to see 10 feet of sea level rise over the next 50 years by Ish. 2065. Then, the next year, I heard <clears throat> Jill Stein talking about a number 9 feet by 2050, and she got that from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They didn't put out a report that I know of, but they made a presentation to like 10,000 insurance industry risk assessors, and that is the number that they told the insurance industry, nine feet by 2050. And then the following year, the state of California had a report that said we're going to see 10 feet of sea level rise by 2087. So all of those are in the ballpark, the same thing. None of them are 3,000 years from now which is still what the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is saying, and most of the world's non-glaciologist climate scientists are saying. They're all still saying, oh, you know, we can avoid the worst. We can't avoid the worst. <laughs> if, if you, ex I mean, maybe if you exclude the flooding of coastal civilization around the entire planet and the end of our capitalist economic system, yeah, I guess that's, you could say that's not the worst. It's not the extinction of all life on Earth which is the worst, but it's something we have to be talking about. And Jared has cost us 10 years of talking about it because he didn't have hearings. He could have had hearings saying, what does it mean that the ice sheets are collapsing and there's 20 feet of sea level rising? What can you tell us about what the time frame was? Nothing, nothing. And now Joe Manchin, 10 years later, can still get away 
arguing against this week. He's arguing against an EPA nominee from Biden because he, he's against Biden's radical climate agenda. He should never have been able to get away from that. And that brings us back to our topic about what do we need from politicians. <laughs> well, we, we need politicians who, even though you have to raise $1.7 million now to get elected to Congress, are not beholden to money interests. Well, I don't think that's possible. So here's where I agree with you entirely, Bud, about the need for public financing. In fact, I'm putting together something I call the Americans United Agenda. And this actually was inspired by Michael Moore. Michael Moore in the 90s wrote a book called Dudes, Where's My Country? <laughs> yeah. And in it is a chapter called Liberal Paradise. And let me just read a little bit of this. Um, I want to tell you about, there's a country I would like to tell you about. It's a country like no other on the planet. Many of you, I'm certain, would love to live there. It's a very, very liberal, liberated, and free-thinking country. Its people hate the thought of going to war. The vast majority of its men have never served in any kind of military, and they aren't rushing to sign up now. They abhor guns and support any and all efforts to restrict the age of personal firearms. Its citizens are strong supporters of labor unions and workers' rights. They believe the corporations are up to no good and should not be trusted. The majority of its residents strongly believe in equal rights for women and oppose any attempt by the government or religious groups who would seek to control their reproductive organs. In overwhelming numbers, the people of this country I speak of believe that gay and lesbian people should have the same opportunities as straight people and they should not be discriminated against in any way. He goes on, but the point is that country is the United States. And the chapter goes through a number of polls that were done by establishment organizations, including the NRA. And, you know, there's stuff like 57% um, of Americans, this is the 1990s, believe that abortion rights should be legal in all or most cases. 83% of Americans say they are in agreement with the goals of the environmental movement. Even two-thirds of Republicans in one poll responded by saying they would vote for an environmentalist candidate over a non-environmentalist. 94% of Americans want federal safety regulations enacted on the manufacture and use of all handguns. Eight in ten Americans believe that health insurance should be provided to equally to everyone in the country. 62% of the people you share the country with support changing current laws so that fewer nonviolent offenders are sent to prison. So in other words, we are in a country where the vast majority of people support the liberal agenda. So on the other hand, what you have is what I call the dumbest 35%. Now, you know there's an IQ scale, right? So that they, they measure intelligence in a certain way on a 100-point scale. But theoretically, you could make other kinds of scales, a scale on superstitiousness. You know, you have the flat earthers at one end, you know, and, and, and I don't know, whoever you have at the the end that we would like, and, and you have like the most racist and um, the most, um, well, let's just, let's just take those three, the most superstitious, the most racist, and the least intelligent. I think those are the people that Fox News knows are the same people, they're all the same people, and these are the people they have been brainwashing, and so this dumbest 35 percent, they are the Trump voters. And what's happened is a lot of people are freaked out about the Trump voters. I'm saying, let's forget them politically. Let's not worry about them. Let's organize that 65%, the liberal paradise people that Michael Moore talked about, and, cre and, and support what I call the Americans United Agenda. And it's just a few things. It's, it's basically the idea is you don't have to change party, you don't have to join anything, but you just take these three or four things, if I can find my sheet of paper now. Um, Oh, here it is. And, and whatever candidate you're thinking about voting for, you just say, how do you, do you support the Americans United agenda? And that has um, four or five things. Medicare for all, public financing of elections, free education through graduate and trade school, and college loan forgiveness, and a $2,000 a month guaranteed income. We, at every election, go to all of our politicians and say, where are you on this? And we forget the people who don't support those things because we know the majority of Americans do. And then we start to get those people elected as independents, maybe, as, maybe Greens could get elected finally, and as Democrats, and even you know, those environmentalist Republicans that Michael Moore was making reference to. And, you know, um, it's getting near the top there. This is Bud Rogers, as you heard, we have as our guest, 
Andy Caffrey, and uh, you've been listening to him. So let's turn it over to Larry and do the top of the hour. Thanks, Larry. You bet. This is Redwood Community Radio, KMUD, Garberville, 91.1 FM, KMUE, Eureka, 88.1 FM, KLAI, Laytonville, 90.3 FM, on the web at kmud.org and at 99.5 FM in Shelter Cove. Back to you, Bud. Okay, yeah, this is Edge of the Herd with Bud Rogers. Andy Caffrey's here. And I'm going to read this thing that I got out of the um, Surveillance Capitalism book by um, Shoshana Zuboff. Um, and, it, and this is about machine intelligence, okay? Once again, a key theme of machine intelligence is that quality is a function of quantity. Realize says that it's data, realize <laughs> says that its data sets contain over 5.5 million individually annotated frames of more than 7,000 subjects from all over the world. We are continually working to build the world's largest expression and behavior data sets by increasing the quality and quantity or volume of our already existing categories and by creating new sets for other expressions, emotions, different behavioral cues, or different intensities, having automated this process, it can then be scaled up to simultaneously track the emotions of entire audiences. Clients are advised to play your audience emotions to stay on top of the game. The company's website offers a brief review of the history and of research on human emotions, con- concluding that the more people feel, the more they spend. Intangible emotions translate into concrete social activity, brand awareness, and profit. So just a little bit more. The chair of CWAS uh, Industrial Ca- Advisory uh, Board um, is frank about this undertaking, observing that unlocking the meaning of the non-spoken language of the whole body and interpreting complex emotional response will be wonderful for interpreting reactions to marketing materials, adding that it is simply foolish not to take emotional response into account when evaluating all marketing materials. Indeed, those unconscious tools extract rarefied new qualities of behavioral surplus from your inner life in order to predict what you will buy in the precise moment at which you're most vulnerable to a push. So C was the advisory chair, says the emotional analytics are like identifying individual musical notes. Each potential customer then is a brief and knowable composition. We will be able to identify chords of human response, such as liking, boredom, etc. (laughs) We will ultimately become masters of reading each other's feelings and intent. And the last thing is... Propaganda and advertising have always been designed to appeal to unacknowledged fears and yearnings. These have relied more on art than science, using gross data or professional intuition for the purpose of mass communication. What all that means is that um, they are manipulating us all the time. Um, If you're on your phone or your internet you know they they know more they know you better than your own mother and um and they can they can uh, guide you by giving you stuff on the internet you know they know what you like to see so they just they just uh send more and more so a point of view is established that is based on what google gives you so um You know, uh, Google for me isn't Google for you. If you put type in the same exact thing, you'll get a different response than me because the robot knows you, and he's not like you're not like me. You know, so this what this does is it amplifies and reinforces points of view that are different from the next guys. So that creates division, and that is one of the ways that we are 
controlled is through, you know, hating this group and that group and you're in this group. You know, it's like, forget about that, you know. That's tribalism or something. I don't know what they call it, but it's not. It's it's not good for um, our society. Yeah, it's it's a fragmentation that we really need to take seriously. Um, in 1991, I lost my home in the Oakland firestorm, and some of the support we got afterwards, clothing that was donated, things like that, was down at the Whole Foods Market. And I can remember standing on the sidewalk, looking over the parking lot after this monstrous fire. This is in Oakland, Berkeley. Um, right next to where the fire was. And the fire took out, I, I believe it was, the homes of 20,000 people. It was massive. It, it looked like a volcano. When I saw it, I thought I was on the edge of a volcano. And so... Where was this at? This is Oakland, California, okay. Okay. 1991. And so when I looked over the parking lot, I thought to myself, you know, I know what every single person I see here is thinking right now because they're, we're all in this together. And then... What happened was that the television stations all stopped airing commercials. They just did news. Um, they started to, like, not tie their ties, and their hair got a little mussed up, and they started talking to us like real people, saying, well, what do you need? Oh, you want to know what to do if you're missing your pet? Okay, we'll find that out for you, and all this kind of stuff. And that lasted about two weeks. And then commercials started to creep back in. And then Oprah was back on. And then some sporting stuff. And I thought about the cover of the Moody Blues album, Every Good Boy Deserves Favor. If you know about that cover, it's a little boy transfixed on a little jewel on a chain that's being hung in front of him. And I thought, what's happened is that little jewel has just been fragmented into a million of them. And now the millions of people in the Bay Area are all looking at millions of different things every day from each other. We don't, it, it, it doesn't matter if you're not using the internet or using a smartphone because the conditioning is being done to the 90% of your friends who are doing it. In fact, let's talk about the Overton window. And this is the, the biggest thing that we have to tackle if we want to talk about getting candidates for office who are useful to us. The Overton window is the range of policies politically acceptable to the mainstream population at a given time. So it's basically, you know, it's why most of you would think, oh, Andy can never be elected because I'm outside of your Overton window and I'm talking about Antarctica and that's not what anybody else is talking about. So what's happened is we've lost 10 years that we need to like start thinking about, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to relocate people? Where are we going to move the people of Arcata and Eureka? Are we going to clear-cut headwaters forest and put them there? <laughs> uh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do about all the refugees who are going to be coming here into Europe and these other places? What are we going to do about capitalism collapsing? And so we're going to lose our jobs. It's going to be like what happened with COVID and the shutdown, but, you know, a hundred times worse, and it's not going to end. So so this, this, this is something I really uh, want to invite people to think, first of all, about when they think about politics, start with reality. Look around yourself. Look at what's happening to the people you know and the people in your community and what's happening to the earth and start thinking about, well, what really does need to happen? And then you start thinking about, okay, how can we get our politicians to, who have caused these problems to reverse course? And my two conclusions are, one, we can't get these people to do things. Jared's a good guy. He's one of the better people in Congress, I think, in a general sense, in terms of where he is on the political spectrum. But he's, he's calling my science videos of NASA material and all this. Kind of, he's calling them weird videos without even watching them. He's lost his mind. Yeah. He's joined a cult. And, and, <laughs> and I, I, I can see I got a little taste of it just as a candidate, you know, how that whole thing works. Basically, when you're running for office, you suddenly... You want to, well, if you care about the people of your district, suddenly, you know, I had to start caring about 700,000 people, most of whom I didn't know, instead of just my views on, on the issues as I had developed in them in my life. I had to start opening myself up to what makes other people happy and, and what they need. 
And so what happens is you basically develop a, a sense that you really want to make every one of them happy. When they say something to you about an issue, you want to be able to say something to them that will make them feel like you're their guy, not just to get their vote, but just you just you want to pat them on the back and say, there, there, we'll take care of this kind of stuff. And man, I mean, can ima- I can imagine what it'd be like actually being in Congress and dealing with that stuff. So, so I'm not picking on Jared. I'm not picking on him at all. I, I am calling him out on some of his failings, you know, and I think they're very important. And uh, by the way, I'm not running for office again, so this is not a I want to make that very clear. This is not a pre-Andy campaign for anything. I don't think I'll run for anything ever again the rest of my life. But, uh, you know... But this, you're in good shape. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's my walk down to the river every day. No, but, but, but you know, I still have exactly the same concerns I had as in, in 2006 when I first started, you know, thinking about, well, God, there's nobody out there who's talking about our greatest national security threat, our collapsing ice sheets. So I, I got to do it and see if I can get that stage, you know. So we have to do things differently. If you think that just supporting Jared or Biden or any of these people is is somehow going to do it because it keeps the Republicans at bay, forget it. They're all corporatists. I mean, you really nailed it when you talked about the public financing. What do you have to do to get $1.7 million? You have to say yes to some people that maybe you didn't want to say yes to. I had an offer for a $5,000 contribution. I had one offer like that from... Uh, and you'll never guess who it was that offered me five thousand dollars. Peabody Coal. <laughs> On my, I, I I had an agenda. I had a seven point agenda when I ran for Congress called the New Green America Agenda. And the very first one is fight the climate crisis as threat number one. Peabody's coal train is all dead away. Right. And so you know, I mean, how is it that you know when when um, when Manchin single-handedly gutted the Build Back was America Build Back America bill or something like that, he he had got the thing cut from I think seven hundred billion dollars for climate stuff to three hundred or something, and uh, and just because he was able to get away with with basically saying, oh well, this climate stuff is radical. How can you get away saying that now? How can Jared let any of these people get away with it? So the first thing I would say about what kind of candidates we need is we need to have people who will call out all of the climate denialists in the body that they serve. And the only way we're going to get them is with public financing. Because I just don't, I don't think these people, you know, I, I had never aspired to run for office. It was not something I did. I was the editor of my high school newspaper, and, and that was about it for me as far as any kind of office. But that, you know, when I was radical media, that wasn't uh, running for office and representing people. The only reason I did in 2006 was I realized I tried everything else to get, I, I wrote this paper on West Antarctica that was published by David Brower in the Earth Island Journal in 1998. So by 2006, I was starting to get worried because nobody else was talking about it. So I felt the only, I mean, I can't, if there was somebody I could have talked to and said, hey, man, you've got to start talking about this issue and I'll, I'll give you the science, I'll support you so that you can, you know, learn the material. I would, I would have dropped out or just not even run the first place in a heartbeat. You know, who the hell wants to go to Washington, D.C.? I love living here in Southern Humboldt. Why would I want to spend time in D.C.? I wouldn't, you know, but we've run out of options. You know, a lot of this stuff, you can't, you can't. Your lifestyle changes aren't going to stop the ice sheets from collapsing. Mm-hmm. These international treaties aren't going to do it. S- when um, was a, I think when Bush got elected, Bush the second, around 2000, uh, all of these progressive state uh, and local government officials, mayors, governors, assembly people, whatever, decided the federal government's not going to do anything on the climate crisis. So they formed a coalition of several thousand of them to try to work together on what they could do about the climate crisis. But the ice sheets are still collapsing. And so whatever level you want to talk about, none of them are going to do it except the main one, the federal government. We have to redirect the federal government. And that's why we, it's really important that we get really clear about how we're going to get the right people in there. And that's why when I, in 2014 I announced that I was running for president and I was calling for an electoral revolution. And then a year later, Bernie announced his run, and 
I think he, he got the idea from me, but he suddenly became the second Democrat running for president calling for revolution. He called for a political revolution, which is weird because that's what Lenin called the Russian revolution. That was a political revolution. And Bernie is definitely not talking about an armed overthrowing and changing of our government when he says political revolution. So I think it was just a way of watering down what I was calling for. The electoral revolution is what I said much earlier in this hour about the need to organize around the, the districts that we lost by 5,000 votes or the districts where the progressives got very close or the Greens got very close and support those people because we have to displace these cult-like Republicans and Democrats who are taking us over the brink. I mean, the reason I'm not running for office now is, I, I, I mean, I'll be real cynical here now, but I think we're doomed. I don't think we are going to pull off what we need to pull off. We've got Biden saying, oh, we can have a better future with our $300 billion subsidy for electric vehicles and was it heat sinks. Oh, that, that's what we're going to do. And then one day... See, the, the West Antarctic ice sheet is going to start collapsing so fast that we're going to see eight inches of sea level rise in one year. And well, everyone I'll, is I'll, going to freak. Andy, all we have to do is everybody, you know, make ice in their refrigerator and ship it to Antarctica. That's a lot of ice. Yeah, or set up some giant nets there to kind of collect them as the icebergs float away and, and kind of... Yeah, some kind of machine to... Push it back up. Yeah, or get a whole bunch of, like, use genetic engineering to make sea elephants. Elephants that can walk on water and you can tie them up like, you know, they used well, to do in Africa and India hundreds of years of, ago. And of pull them back in. Uh, worth of pl- uh, uh, algae. Uh, you know, algae. Um, it's huge. You know, Organize gonna, the algae. Uh, radical uh, algae uh, alliance. <laughs> one thing, one plan they had to do is a... Uh, is, uh, Dump uh, iron oxide in, onto the surface of the ocean, and then uh, the the plankton would grow to such an extent that it would take all the carbon out of the air. Is Bud Rogers advocating geoengineering? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's one of ge- geoengineers uh, have. Uh, oh, that was the first one I ever heard about. But you know, here let me read something about the banks because they're in back of everything. Banks create the money they lend. The modern banking system manufactures money out of nothing. The process is perhaps the most astounding piece of sleight of hand that was ever invented. Banking was conceived in inequity and born in sin. Bankers own the earth. Take it away from them, but leave them the power to create money, and with the flick of a pen, they would create enough to buy it back again. That's Sir Joe Sia Stamp, president of the Bank of England, and a second richest man in Britain in the 20s, speaking at the University of Texas in 1927. Now, here's one from Graham Towers, governor, governor of the Bank of Canada. Banks create money. That is what they are for. The manufacturing process to make money consists of making entries in a book. That is all. Each and every time a bank makes a loan, new bank credit is created. Brand new money. And so there's one last one here. We are completely dependent on the commercial banks. Someone has to borrow every dollar we have in circulation, cash or credit. If the banks create ample synthetic money, we are prosperous. If not, we starve. So uh, that was Robert H. Hemphill, credit manager of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, writing in 1934. (laughs) And, um, (laughs) of course... Banks do not really pay out loans from the money they receive as deposits. If they did this, no additional money would be created. What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes in exchange for credits to the borrower's transaction accounts. Loans, or assets, and deposits, which are liability, both rise by the same amount. If you can, if you can wrap your brain around that. That's Chicago Federal Reserve. Um, let me issue and control a nation's currency, and I care not who makes the laws. And that's Amschel Rothschild in 1791. And um, the few who understand the system will either be so interested in its profits or so dependent upon its favors that there will be no opposition from that class, while, on the other hand, the great body of people mentally incapable of comprehending will bear its burdens without complaint.
<laughs> and, and, you know, let's open the phone lines. Um, oh, and one last thing about that is Jefferson had a solution. Thomas Jefferson. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Now that's, you know, that's terrible statement, but the issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. And that's Thomas Jefferson, letter to the Secretary of the Treasury, Albert Gallatin, 1802. And uh, he was the Jefferson third president of the United States. Well, I think that's sort of a, a technical symptom of what's really the problem, which is we have to start talking about class. We're in a class war. A, a guy I grew up with, a guy named Marty Gillins, was on a, a Daily Show when John Stewart was still there because he's a, he was a professor at Princeton. Now he's at UCLA. And he did a study of what interests get their bills passed through government. Mm. And what he found was that we the people get 0% of our agenda. Just think about that, that list of things I read from Michael Moore's book in 1995. We haven't gotten any of those things. I mean, I guess we've got gay marriage, but that's totally at risk now. So um, we, we really have to recognize that even if a person says, a, oh, you know, uh, I, I'm a I'm pro-choice woman and, and um, you know, I, I care about the environment, you know, and... Uh, I have a lot of sensitivity to, and I'm not, I don't mean to say this in some sexist way, I just mean, um, I, I'm thinking about Nancy Pelosi as I'm talking about this, and I do not like Nancy Pelosi. But, but people say things, the politicians say things to reach our emotions, like you were talking about earlier, and they want to show you that they think about a lot of these things the way we do. But then, just like with all the right-wingers, <laughs> The right wingers have succeeded in getting the dumbest 35 to vote for them on a couple of issues on abortion and on guns. And so those people, because they've been manipulated on those two issues, have kept in power the warmongers, the planet killers, the, the, the people putting the pipelines through our wilderness areas. They've just gone along with that and said, well, well at least he's, you know, he wants to end abortion rights. Because when you vote for somebody, basically, if you feel strongly about an issue, like for me, it's the environment. I mean, the, the positions of a person on the environment are the ones that are going to decide if I vote for that person or not. So I don't knock people for that. It's just the way our system works. You can only really make your choice. You, you can't vote for somebody. 222-22. What? Oh. Uh, it was just 222-22. I like that stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we don't really have a way of voting for people around an array of issues we're concerned about. And so they have got these people thinking, well, first of all, I've got something here about life. What is life? You know, a lot of the anti-abortion people, they say, oh, life begins at conception. No, no. Life began only once on this planet, 3.9 billion years ago. And those cells have been dividing and fusing in and out of different kinds of forms um, for 3.9 billion years. I'll be right back. And so uh, when you were conceived, you, your life didn't come out of nothing. Your mother's egg and your father's sperm were living cells. They fused. You got your life as part of that continuity going back 3.9 billion years from them. So, and where did they get their life from? From their parents. And that's the way we are all, every single organism on this earth is a brother and sister. We are all expressions of that, those first cells 3.9 billion years ago. So the idea that life begins at conception is just crap. Now, what we can say, because, you know, obviously something is different when an egg and a sperm come together and suddenly you have this new person that comes out of it. Um, I, the way I think of it is we have different life forms, but no life starts, 
you know, <laughs> okay, I'll get a little uh, obscure here, but about 10 years ago, scientists discovered that almost all human beings, homo sapiens, are not just homo sapiens. We're not even a single species. We all have, except for the um, blackest of Africans who have no um, ancestors who lived outside of that area of Africa, they're the only pure Homo sapiens. Everyone else is a descendant of Neanderthals, and if you have Pacific Island ancestry or Northeast Asian ancestry, you probably also have some Denisovan DNA in you. So the whole idea of humans being a unique species that have a spiritual nature is false because, well, if Homo sapiens have a spirit, then, well, is, do the, does the DNA in me not have, is it like got a black hole, it doesn't have a spiritual route, or the Denisovan DNA? So, um, you know, just, just people have a lot, that's something else we should get into now, which is a lot of the problem is us, not the politicians. It's our worldview, it's our limitations from the Overton window. All of us start out with a bunch of crap put into our heads. I was raised in a family that was mostly Catholic. And I knew at a very early age, because two weeks after I was born, Sputnik was launched into outer space. I actually lived, and you too, when there were no satellites around the Earth. So when Sputnik happened, Americans just freaked out. And we had this crash program of training our kids with science. Well, so they, with me, I learned... They freaked us out. We, uh, the public didn't know what it meant until they were told. Well, yeah, it was the military completely freaked out that they had these, these satellites up there. And so, the, you know, the whole intercontinental ballistic missile thing came out of, you know, the space program. Um, I don't know if you younger people know, but the whole NASA thing was really a military operation. Well, and then they, they, brought, they, they, they made brought, it all friendly with sending monkeys into after space. After World War II, uh, they brought um, Nazi scientists over here mm -hmm. to work for NASA. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, so there, you know, I talked about the dumbest 35 percent. I'm also thinking about the people who think that the Bible is journalism. You know, uh, th th those would be what I would call the most superstitious, at, you know, at the most superstitious end of that spectrum, the ones who are literalists about the Bible. So anyway, a, a lot of us, uh, you know, a lot of us, a lot of my friends, you know, a lot of people we all know, a lot of people listening to this, they believe in some kind of spiritual reality. And if you go with the Je Judeo-Christian Islamic model of what is spiritual reality, only humans have a spirit. And only humans, you know, go into the spiritual universe that we call heaven. And the thing is, well, that meant that Neanderthals didn't, and gorillas don't, and orangutans don't, and my cats don't, and, you know, go on down to mice and, and crickets and uh, bacteria don't have a spiritual reality. So I'm saying this because I went through a process when I was about 10, well, actually even earlier, my, my grandfather gave me his college, he was a pathologist at Cedar sinai and he gave me his, his microscope that he used at Cornell and gave me these stained uh, cell slides that I looked at. So I was totally into that. When I heard about Genesis, oh, you know, the earth was created in six days. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Light came on the third day. How could there be light before he created the, I mean, there's light was, was original. And then on the third day, you know, God supposedly created the, the heavens and above us. So how could there have been light without stars, that, you know, and, and the things that create light? It, was just, it just did not make sense to me. So I abandoned my religious programming. Then the Vietnam right. War was happening. And with all the teachings and the hippies and the radical actions, I learned that America was not fighting for, for good things. And so I was able to blow apart the programming I had about political reality here. And then you just keep on going. You just, you know, you get into psychedelics in college or whatever. And the other things about, you know, our programming, most people blow those things off. And so we have a lot of problems now where this Overton window keeps really good people 
ignoring things like I'm talking about with Antarctica, they, well, where they well, say, we, well, want, we want to support Biden because well, we're so afraid of going after Biden because then the Republicans will get back in. And yeah. that's where we are trapped. We're trapped because everyone has been programmed to think that Trump is so horrible. Trump is a little wart on the ass of the Republican Party. <laughs> the Republican Party is the largest organized crime syndicate and terrorism network in world history, and the Democratic Party is the second largest organized crime syndicate and terrorism network in world history, and that's the choice we have. Okay. And you may not want to accept that. You may want to think that, oh, but Jared's not that way, or, or you know, Joe Biden, he's really friendly with those guys who have stuttering problems. Oh, da, 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 da. It's just, it's, that's not how we're going to solve our problems. Okay, it, hold on a second. If we do that. Um, we're going to turn it over to Larry for the bottom of the hour identification uh, tell people who listen to you're you. getting me worked up bud <laughs> yeah. yeah all right you're listening to redwood community radio kmud garberville kmue eureka klai Laytonville. we're also on the web at kmud.org and if you're in shelter cove 99.5 fm yeah so uh, here we are back um as Bud Rogers had just heard, we have Andy Caffrey stepped up to get a little water. Um, and uh, I have uh, some little puns uh, here. Um, when it's our rights are being eroded <laughs> in terms of the Internet. And when Putin comes to shove, there's another pun. When Putin comes to shove, <laughs> how about crying goes with the territory? Uh, here's another Putin one. Rootin', tootin', Putin. And here's one, another Putin. The proof is in the Putin. <laughs> <laughs> Putin ain't putting up with us. <laughs> with a U.S. <laughs> entrenching, U.S.'s entrenchments, butting in, stupidity, etc. <clears throat> and I've done a pun of research. <laughs> and resin reason. Pot smokers are very resonable folks. <laughs> and static electricity. What about ecstatic electricity? We all live in electric cities. <laughs> Electricities. Yeah, yeah electricities. <clears throat> and I'm not happy till the pun comes up. <laughs> On cloudy days, you can barely see the pun. <laughs> and anyway, so. Uh, Oh, this you know, officers when they arrest somebody, a resisting client, uh, uh, you know, somebody who's resisting arrest, they can use a pun gun on them to reduce the fifty-one fifty <laughs> to a guy on the ground laughing his guts out. You know, you just have to make them laugh, and then you got them under control. You don't have to kill them or beat them up. Anyway, so we're back with with Andy. What you got for us, Andy? Well, you know, I'd like to hear from callers. You know, I've kind of just thrown yeah, a yeah. whole load of stuff on you, right? But l let's go back to, like, what are you concerned about right now, this morning? Did you wake up concerned about some issue? Now, now stop for a second. Think. Do like a, a, a linkage, like a supply chain. Um, Rolling Thunder talked about the chain link effect where the way he could make rain is he would start with what he could affect right next to him, and the next thing would go to the next link, and the next thing would go to the next link, and, and then somehow <laughs> it would get to the atmosphere and create rain. Well, th that's also how you, you know, if you're going to run for office, there's a whole series of things you need to do. I could do some of them, but I did not have the support to really do a full campaign like I should, and so I did not succeed in getting elected. Um, but we're still left with all of these problems. I mean, look at your kids right now. Think about your grandkids. What are you most worried about? And I'd like to know what you think we, we can do about these things. What steps pragmatically can we, we take? A lot of people think about politics as a battle of ideologies. I think of it the same way I think about organizing something. If we, I open and close the town square restroom every day. Well, that was a project that, you know, started with people like Deborah Carey and, and some others of us over a decade ago. And then another committee kind of came together, 
and they did specific things, and they worked with the town square, and then they got some people together who actually designed it and constructed it, and then they got me to open and close the thing and clean it up. So those were all specific steps that got us to the point where we now have a public restroom in Carberville. So when I look at politics, I think, how can we do the same thing to get the big issues taken care of? You know, how can we get our politicians to do stuff? It's my conclusion, my view, that we can't get them to do it. We, we, we can't, that we have to replace them. But I'd like to hear what's on your mind, and I'd also like to hear from people who think, who, who have ideas about, you know, how, how should we frame things around the class issue? Yeah, and, you know, 707-923-3911 is the magic number to call in. And we, we want need callers, and we the further away from uh, California, the better, you know. People li- are listening all over the world, is what I understand. And you know what? A company uh, did some research and uh, found out that um, KMUD was the, the most listened to radio station in a huge area, like... <laughs> Tri County and beyond, you know. Mm. Oh, well, I know that there's a lot of people all around the world who listen to Cayman. So, hi to all of our <laughs> yes. non Humboldt County listeners. We're <laughs> thinking of you and we appreciate your support. Don't forget, and we support free speech radio here behind the Redwood Curtain. And we have a call. You, uh, or maybe we have a call. I think we do. And Larry's putting it on. Uh, <laughs> not yet, though. Maybe there, some people call and want to make a suggestion or a comment, and uh, they just tell it to the engineer because they don't want to come on the air. Oh, uh, oh okay. Uh, we got two callers. Let's take one okay. now. Hi, callers. Good afternoon, buongiorno. I'm <laughs> calling from Emilia Romagna, a beautiful, dry now province in northern Italy. Wow. Well, that's I funny because I saw you last night. <laughs> and I would like to say my grandmother was the 14th child of Giovanni Ferrari that got exported to Plymouth, Massachusetts, a place of very waspy New Englanders. Yeah. But he became a self-made millionaire, and it wasn't only from pushing a fruit cart. It was from hard work. Something that you hippies don't know anything about, do you? What is it? Hard work. Hard work. Oh, hard uh, I, work. I, I, I open, Sitting clean. Around smoking doobie after doobie. Oh, like I. The doobie brothers. Yeah. Ev- every, I, every. I like, I like soft work. Than that. He was in World War II, making radio transmitters. <laughs> get it? Oh, you get yeah, it. Yeah, I get it. I like the way you make a point. Whoa. You see, here's an example of the dumbest 35 percent. Billions off of it. I don't make a dime. I clean toilets every day. I don't know about you. It should be shut down like a zoom bomb. Why don't you get an oil well? Oh. (laughs) Okay. Well, we got another one. That wasn't about class division. Um, Hello. Hello. (laughs) That was exciting and a tough act to follow. Yeah. Well, just start from scratch. I'm uh, the the only issue that has any resonance or importance on Earth today is climate change, the, and nothing is being done about it. The uh, carbon emissions continue to increase. Uh, the temperature continues to rise, mm-hmm. and our government is uh, paralyzed on the issue. And I don't know what else to say. So you feel hopeless, like I do. Well, no, I don't. I'm, in my, I'm, I'm 76 years old, and uh, I've had a good run. And I, I'm curious to observe what's going to happen in the next whatever. I, think, I, I figure, actually, I'm planning on living another 30 years. So I may get to see real disaster, and I may get to see, you know, something exciting and wonderful happen. But, uh, you know, I, do you see... Any progress in the direction of uh, actual 
physical progress in the addressing of climate change on the planet. Yeah, the first thing they should do is take the hot air that's producing Congress and instead of letting it go <laughs> into the atmosphere, use it for an energy source. The, the, other, the, the other way it could be addressed uh, sort of has been addressed in my family. I'm one of four siblings. I'm the only one who reproduced. I only had one child, and he isn't going to have any children. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, takes a little bit of the burden off. But, man, I still see people having, I mean, that last girl, her grandparents had 14 children, uh, and I'm sure that they all, being Catholics from Italy, all had, you know, 19 of their own, and they've got 477 grandchildren now. And that's a a huge portion of the problem. Yeah, yeah. But also, nobody wants to do without (laughs) anything. Nobody's willing to give up one thing. Well, okay, <laughs> I think a lot of people here in our area well, were so willing too, to give course, give up a I'm lot of the material crap. Has given up. I, 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 actually, I haven't given up. I never adopted uh, a lot of the things that are uh, contributing to climate change because I've been in this for 50 years. You know, well, I've been aware of the concept of climate change since the whole Earth catalog came out. Right. Oh, yeah. Me too. Right. And, yeah, and I, I agree that there are plenty of people in our little microcosm here that feel that way and that have done those things. But a lot of them are still driving big diesel trucks and uh, expanding their swimming pools. And, you know, maybe they put up a solar panel. I don't know. I think that there's uh, uh, people just don't want to give anything up. They want their luxury, and they don't care if it starves people to death and cooks the rest of us. Yep. I had a, another really interesting professor at UCSD, a guy named Herbert Marcuse. Mm. Oh, I remember him. Yes, yeah. and he gave a lecture that's still the most impactful lecture I've ever heard in my life. And what he talked about was, contrary to the notion of original sin, that we are all born emancipatory, life-affirming, eros-oriented. And what happens is things like Oh, the way school is, where you have 50 minutes to do a p- specific subject, then you walk to your next class or whatever, and do another one, and then the 40-hour work week, and then the whole thing of you know tr- getting in traffic jams and all this kind of stuff, it basically bottles us up, and it's like putting your hand on the end of a hose, and the water builds up, and then it springs a bunch of leaks, which are, for us, our pains, and our orientation shifts to being compensatory. We go from being a man, naturally caring and doing the right thing and being in balance with nature to being oriented towards stopping our own personal pain. And then as the stuff that, that Bud was reading, all that kind of big data stuff controlling you know, what goes into our minds, our, our lives become oriented because we don't even, I mean, now we don't even know how do you, I mean, we do here, a lot of us here in Southern Humboldt, the back to the land people do, but most people don't know what would it be like to be a balanced human being where I feel good about my life and I don't have toxic Man. relationships and all that you, kind of stuff. make me cry. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's That's the problem. Everyone is feeling pain. of their pain. Yeah, you know. They, they, they hide it from themselves. And it's really, uh, really sad. Yeah, I live, a, 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 you know, I, I, I'm not a hero or a saint or anything, but I live a really uh, slow, happy, uh, peaceful, out in the garden, chopping my wood, quiet, happy life. With, you know, I don't, I don't need uh, cable TV and, uh, yeah. man... I don't, whatever else there is, I don't know what else. <laughs> well, you know I something don't even that know what all well, the well, things keep, are. Keep listening to you know? Kama, though. But, but yeah. I know that all I have to do is get on the internet, and I can see. And I do have the internet. I have a little phone, and I have internet, and I can see what people buy every day, what what sells, man. And it's just garbage. <laughs> it's just garbage, and it all ends up in the Great Pacific Gyre, and uh, it's really depressing. Yeah, and I yeah. try to ignore it because I don't want to be depressed. I want to enjoy my flowers. Well, you know, I think we can be teachers here. I mean, now with YouTube and all of that, there's a lot of stuff that we've done here. I, I actually came up here. I'm one of the few people I've met around here who did not come here for the pot. 
I came here to help Earth First save Headwaters Forest. Oh, cool. And the Sinkion, I worked on the Sinkion before that. Did but, you know Barefoot George? I'm not sure. Doesn't matter. Yeah. But the other thing was I saw a KQED special on bioregionalism with David Simpson and Freeman House from Petrolia. Well, and I, I worked with, the, with David Simpson was my neighbor in Marin. Oh, we well, yeah, well, yeah, and then down in the Bay Area, you had Peter Berg and the Planet Drum yep. Society that was working on that whole thing. And and, and I'm glad you we're getting into this because the, you know uh, we've talked about what the politicians will or won't do, and and the things they're doing that are completely inadequate. But what what would we want to do? And and my thinking, I remember hearing about how we grow salads in the Central Valley that are shipped to Ottawa, Canada. And so the first thing we can do is to support the development of, what shall I call it, the means, the, the institutions, the businesses as close to home as possible that Lo- produce local- the things we need. Localization. Oh, well, sure. What is localization, and, but you, you, you know, have to do it within we, the bioregion. We all here have such great experience and knowledge of growing in greenhouses or indoors. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and they could grow salads anywhere now. Yes, and, and well, they, do, they do it with weed. They grow weed anywhere. That's right. You know, so, so the thing is, if we basically thought, okay, let's assess our nation, and it has to be done globally too, but let's start to think, what are our biological regions? And the reason bioregions are important, not just localization, is whatever you extract is coming from a specific ecosystem that has ecological tolerances. So if you're within the bioregion and you get everything you need from the bioregion, you go, uh-oh, if we pull any more of this out for construction, let's say, cut any more trees for construction, we're going to, like, diminish the ability of the forest to reproduce itself. Yeah, and I just want to make a note that uh, on s- uh, subsequent shows, I'm going to bring forward uh, some ideas about alternatives to lumber to build oh, homes, sure. you know? But that we, goes back to population, and you know, and the in, you know, ever increasing population requires <laughs> ever increasing building, although it really doesn't. But but, uh, you know. but when I when I put this idea forward, it's going to uh, show that it's uh, you can use the soil or the sand or you know the rocks. <laughs> They're all well, around have, you. Yeah. In Kansas, the folks there don't have the, you know the forests that we have, so they might make theirs out of straw bale. Yeah, and, and you in know the what? Southwest, they might make it out of adobe. There, uh, Europeans lived in sod houses. Yeah. I know. And and uh, you're all assuming that we have time, and yeah. I'm assuming that we don't. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. Uh, no uh, but, uh, I, I'm just I, saying, what are the things that we would have to do? I mean, I think we, we've already lost time. The ice sheets are collapsing. We can't prevent the ice sheets from collapsing now. That's it. You know, and That's when you it. have that big a hit on the coastal civilization of every country that had 154 have coastlines, well, and it's not just what the economies can, can like in tolerate India, that? All their drinking water comes from the glaciers, you know, for the mm-hmm. entire subcontinent. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's so, so it's sad. It's not just yeah. sea level rise. It's like, oh, wh- whoop, we ran dry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think about all the people who live like in, in the Andes and stuff. And oh, man. People in India who get their water from the Himalayan glaciers. And, oh, I mean, those like kinds said, of destruction are just call. terrible. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, but, you know, Ed Abbey and, and Joan Baez said action is the antidote for despair. And so, you know, I, I'm even though I'm kind of very pessimistic that we're going to organize we're not going to do. I don't think we're going to do any of the things I've talked about in the last hour. I just yeah. don't think it's going to happen. But it is the stuff that would have to happen. And since it's not going to happen, I think we're just going to blow it. I think we're going to blow it. I think it. we're just going to blow it. And yeah. people will be staying attached to their smartphones because these little cookies designed, uh, were designed to reinforce your attention to your smartphone by giving you the things you most want to see. I remember when I first got on the Internet, I love Frank Zappa. And I was working for this guy, and after he, he designed software, and after he finished for the day, I could then use the Internet. So I'd start working on the Internet around 6 o'clock, and I'd still be on it at like 7 in the morning. <laughs> and I remember checking out Frank Zappa sites. 
And I went, oh, my God, there's, like, so much stuff here. As a kid, I was a rock concert photographer because you couldn't – they didn't have YouTube. They didn't have videos. You couldn't right. – you can only find pictures of your favorite bands in, in these music magazines. So I was doing that, and then suddenly it's like, there's infinity. The, 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 the channels don't turn off at 2 in the morning and come back on at 4 in the morning. There's nothing stopping you from getting completely sucked in to the things you most love to fill your attention with. And so one of the things here, I think we need to start thinking about mediated reality in our lives and the ecological reality in our lives. Well, I love people, getting up and, and, and saying hello to the ravens as I go over to open up the town square restroom. Course. You the know, that's not mediated when, reality. When we all Europeans arrived right here where we are, the people who lived here then were fat and made art. Hmm. This is an ideal place for human beings to live. They could, you can live outside. I lived outside for the first 15 years I lived in Humboldt County. Wow. You can live outside. Yes. It doesn't, I mean, even though we had a little snow this year, we didn't have that much snow. And if you had a roof over your head, you were fine. And if you, if you just had a sleeping bag and a good coat, yeah. you're not going to freeze to death and you're not going to roast to death if and you don't have air there's conditioning. there's no salmon and there's, you know... We cut down a lot of the forest, and our rivers are running dry, and good luck. Yeah. Well, that's why I think we really have to think in terms of a class war. We have to take our country back. You know, AOC, bless her heart, um, what, the thing that really pissed me off with Huffman is I asked him, well, what's the latest on the Green New Deal? You know, and, and AOC, she only got 6,000 more votes than I got here, but that was enough <laughs> to get her elected in the Bronx. So she does this whole thing about the Green New Deal, and I was just cheering her on, and I thought it was great. And then Jerry says, oh, well, it's a resolution. It's not even legislation. Nope, There's no program for doing yeah. anything to change civilization. It's just a little freaking resolution in Congress that everyone's ignoring. And I don't know why AOC isn't raising hell. I think it's because... You know, like I said, her, 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 well, I, I, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't judge her that way. I, I think, like I said, once you get in there, you, you naturally want to, to do things with people. You want to make things happen. You and we so. have to go to war with some of these people. I see Bernie just reintroduced the Medicare for All with a, 120 people signed on to it. But, you know, that's only less than a quarter of the people who need to vote for it. Well, what was going to ha if I had gotten elected, what I was going to do is I was going to organize Earth First like massive direct action campaigns to shut down the offices of the fossil fuel politicians. That would you be know, nice. go to the White House. I mean, that's what it's going to take and and, and I think if we have our own bill um, like I had said this Americans United agenda or the Green New Deal um, and we say we're not going to leave until you introduce this and start voting on this. If she, think, the reason I don't like Nancy Pelosi is Nancy Pelosi never fought because she didn't want to do anything that would wreck her win-loss record. Right. So what she needed to do is get all of the Republicans on the record voting against stuff so that we could point to them and say, oh, they voted against this and this and this right. and this and this and this and this. You've got to get rid of these bastards. But nope, she didn't want her win-loss record to get messed up, and so she didn't. She didn't impeach George W. Bush. She didn't. She could. She should have impeached the five Supreme Court justices uh, who yeah, overthrew Al Gore's election. Who now, because the Democrats, I call them the coward Dems, the Democrats didn't do anything. These same people just overturned Roe versus Wade, and this Pretty is just the beginning. Uh, the Citizens the United. People on the planet. They Those could have Supreme stopped Court all of it. Man. As Michael Moore pointed out, we got. Two thirds of the American people on our side. How come we're always losing? The Democrats are always costing us everything. Like I said, Professor Martin Gillens, my childhood friend, he says we get nothing, and yet our minds, you know, we're, we're programmed. We, we, we. I mean, I still, I, I watch some TV, and I'm on the internet a lot. So you know, this stuff comes in, and we just kind of, it's easy to stay with that. It's kind of weird. If you watch TV a lot or you are on the Internet a lot, use your smartphone, try one day to not use it and oh, see if oh. you come up with things to do, like with friends or neighbors or in your garden or going for a walk or Definitely. playing with pets. You know, I mean, it, it's, fact, it's, we're messed up people. Right now, I need to hang up because I've got to go to the uh, flower show in Weah. Okay. Nice. Thank Lovely you talking for to you. Call. Thank That's you for your call. Headed. Thanks for and being we, on the air. You yeah, bet. and we have another call coming in. Hello, caller. 
Hey, good afternoon, and want Howdy. to say I'm enjoying the radio show. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Can I hear you? I thought I was pissing people off. <laughs> no, well, maybe you are. I don't know. That's. I think that's kind of a necessity. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm willing but, to take uh, the hits. You know, I know that people really want to get concerned about the environment, but the only way we're going to do it is by really stymieing the Republican Party. Yeah. It's hell-bent to keep things as things were. Um, Unfortunately, it's getting scarier and scarier. I've got a lot of Republican friends, and their psychology is, you know, uh, back to God. um, And, uh, you know, damned if I'm not going to, I'm sorry, uh, get rid of my gasoline car and my weed eater. Um, we really got to change the policy. And the only way we're going to do that is, you know, really unite around a Democratic front. And uh, it's also incredibly cr- critical for our nation <clears throat> as a whole if we want to keep our nation. Because I do see the Republicans doing everything they can to absolutely sabotage democracy. Yep. Well, that's why we played, that was my first congressional campaign spot at the very beginning of the show. The first thing I said was, the, this is 2012, the Republicans are destroying our democracy. They're literally dismantling it. That was 11 years ago. Yeah. And I want to... Way uh, before Trump. I want to say that we're running out of time now, and uh, we're going to have to use the rest of the time to uh, do our outro. So thank you All for... All right, well, I really appreciate the show and the thoughts. Good and, luck. Uh, I appreciate what you're talking dollars. about, man. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. You too. And Andy, so give us a, you know, an overall um outro comment, you know, to put all of the all of those thoughts together. Well, you know, one thing I think we can work on is that most of us do hate the Republicans. And I think the caller's right. I I was putting the Democrats and Republicans in the same boat because they are generally. But I do think the sequence would be we start knocking those Republicans out. We're we're not that far away from doing it. But then after we – I think there should be a RICO investigation of the Republicans. What, yeah. How much crime are they going to get away with, especially under the Trump administration and January 6th and all this stuff? How, but, you know, Garland, I, I don't know, I have a feeling he's on the autism spectrum or something. He just doesn't get anything. And so I do think that, that like the caller said, let's organize and get rid of those Republicans. And you might, if you want to travel, I'm not encouraging people to burn fossil fuels, but my, my uncle, I remember he went to a couple of different states to, to, to go door to door for Obama. Let's get behind these people who just lost by a few thousand votes and encourage them to run again. And then once we have disempowered the Republican Party, then we focus on the centrist Democrats. You know, the Debbie Wasserman Schultzes, the Pelosi's, the Feinsteins. And we start to get, you know, progressive Democrats and and Greens in there. I mean, I helped start two Green parties. That'd be good. You know, the, the, the Greens are started with a whole different perspective. Uh, the German Greens were talking about bioregionalism. I consider myself what they called a fundy green, a fundamentalist okay. green. Okay, thank you, so Andy. So that's where we have to go. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, and uh, what I, I call them the Bomacrats and the Rebomlicans because they'll both get us into wars. Yeah, we didn't It's not them that. that does it, but it's the CIA. And I'll t- talk more about this on subsequent programs. Larry, do you have an outro Let me just song say, for us? Can I say my, my website? Yeah, you, yeah if, you, if you want to check out more of what I've done, I, I have a lot of stuff at YouTube. Just look for my name, Andy Caffrey, C-A-F-F-R-E-Y, at YouTube. And I do a lot of stuff at Facebook, and I do a lot of stuff at Twitter. Okay, thank you. This has been Bud Rogers, as you heard. We had Andy Caffrey with us today. Very good conversation. And, uh, you know, so love to all. Um, thank you, Larry, for uh, engineering, and uh, thank you, Kmud, for you, for being here. And the block party was, I hope, a success. I think it was. I think, Larry, you might have time to play that that last uh, joke. And a Democratic candidate for Congress right here in California, a man named Andy Caffrey, says if he wins the election, he will smoke a joint on the steps of Capitol Hill, and if he has to, he will even get arrested. Finally, a politician who makes a promise he can actually keep. There you go. Finally, finally. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so we're done, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're Thank done. Agnes is going to take over and uh, do her good show. So is that what you were hoping for? Yeah. Okay. Good. That one. Okay. That one. Excellent. There was a lot of meat in there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, people were listening, and that's why they didn't call. You know, I had a couple of callers, but they want to. You know, they're finally hearing words that mean something. Well, I hope I'm just starting a conversation. Yeah.